since we know that all living matter consists of cells, of course, membrane proteins are in, or membranes at all are in the focus. And of course, a cell must have communication from the outside to the inside and must also transport materials from the inside to the outside. And this goes over the membrane which normally protects the cell from things from the outside and also that the inside does not go from itself to the outside. And this is done, all this is done by membrane proteins. And therefore, membrane proteins are very important. Unfortunately, it took a very long time until one was able to study membrane proteins. And I can tell you that normally, when you want to study a protein, the basis is that you know its structure. Structure of a protein you see by X-ray crystallography normally, in former times at least. And it took a long time until membrane protein structure came out. The first membrane protein that people were working on comes from an archibacteria, that was bacteriorhodopsin. And people around the world tried for 40 years to crystallize it. It was not possible until 10 years ago or so, or 40, 15 years ago. And then uh, it starts that many membrane proteins could be crystallized because a certain method was discovered. And since that time, we know a lot more about membrane proteins, although it is still uh, only, say, compared to water-soluble proteins, only 5% of that. Also, these proteins are so important because to see how communication works over the cell is very important and also the, the, the transport of materials. Just to tell you that from the first membrane proteins which were solved, uh, uh, that was involved in drug discovery. Because people are, uh, these, if you, uh, these proteins can be easily uh, manipulated by drugs from the outside. You just put it in the blood or you eat something of this drug and it, it binds to that singling protein and then it stops to do this or it increases its, its, its uh, business. And this is, as you see, important for medicine and for pharmaceutical companies. And therefore, in the United States, where they, are, where they started this commercialization of it, milliarden, or in the United States, the billions of dollars were coming from such research in, in companies which take these things up. It's not only the structure, of course. Besides the structure, you must then take spectroscopic methods, many biophysical methods to find out. But before you can crystallize a protein, you must take it out of the cell. In the cell, it is often in very low amount. And then you have to increase it, the amount, and that you do by gene technology. You take the gene out, put it in a bacterial cell, and this bacterial cell produces it in high amount. Then you take it out again, purify it, and then you try to make a crystal. And then you go to a synchrotron in Grenoble or everywhere in the world, and then you get an X-ray structure, and then when you have the structure, people can work on improving the drugs because they can then, with high precision, go to, a, uh, to their programs in the computer, do molecular, uh, uh, how to call it, uh, molecular dynamics, and then can improve the drugs considerably. And this is the way how many companies proceed nowadays. But you know that before a drug is really given to the people, they have these clinical trials, which are very uh, expensive. So it takes up to 10 years from the beginning until the clinical trial, trials are finished. And that is the way now people work on it. I said already that uh, the, the structure of a protein is a basis on which you can work. But to really find out how it works, you need a lot of methods. And one important method is, of course, uh, f uh, uh, infrared spectroscopy. Because, for instance, in many cases, you can follow up in what part of the protein conformational changes occur. 
And this is important because a protein, when it is folded, normally a protein is a linear stretch of amino acids. And it becomes a machine when it is folded. And to understand this machine, you need often spectroscopic methods. When you know the basis uh, by a structure, then you can follow up by the spectroscopic uh, methods where in the structure, when you say you have a protein like rhodopsin here in the eye, you give a flash of light, and then you look what happens in time when this flash of light comes to your rhodopsin in the eye, which gives you the vision, and what occurs in time. Then this spectroscope method uh, can really tell you what happens in what part of the protein. And then you know the function. And of course, this is also important for drug discovery in other cases. Maybe you can do it in many cases, but it's not only that, you can also do enema. What is the, uh, the difference between or the advantage of enema to X-rays? In enema, you can study proteins which are not in the crystal. When you have a protein in the crystal, the conformational changes outside the protein are hindered off by the packing. You know, and therefore, in an NMR experiment, you have it all in solution. So the protein is free to do its conformational changes. On the other hand, an NMR experiment of a bigger protein, say of 40 kilodalton, takes two years or three years. Whereas, uh, to find the structure when you have crystals is one week. So you see already the difference. But one has to say that X-ray crystallography was invented in Germany in the beginning of, say, 1900 by Laue. And then Breck in England continues with on, on working on, on natural substances. And, and now we are much ahead. Maybe in uh, 50 years, Enema is very strong. And will uh, then many people will go to Enema. But now another method is coming up that is uh, free electron lasers. X-ray crystallography has one bad point, and that is radiation damage. When you put an X-ray beam on a crystal, after a while it is gone. So people were thinking, can we uh, prevent from this? And so they invented free electron laser. That is something which can make X-ray uh, pulses, which are in, uh, which are, have a length of from one femtosecond to 30, 300 frames to second. On your wish, say you want 10 frames to second, then they can make it 10 frames to second. And they put in this pulse a lot of photons, of X-ray photons. And they go then within, say you make a pulse of 10 frames to second, they only irradiate your crystal for 10 frames to seconds. And then it is destroyed because the, the number of photons is very high. But the, the reflections, the information is already on the detector before it falls in pieces. So you see, uh, that is the way we are going. Because the thing is that in, 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 in maybe in far future, we need not any have crystals. We can do it on a single protein. People dream of it, that they will have more and more. But of course, there is a limit. You cannot press electrons, bunches, which are in this in this free electron laser together. The free electron laser gives photons which are coming from electron bunches which are in a magnetic field always changing their direction. And when they change direction, photons are emitted. And this is a principle. But you can also do some very interesting thing which is uh, um, holography. You see, holography is, is also a nice subject normally with visible light. But then you can also holography with, uh, with uh, X-ray photons. And then you could see maybe in, in one pulse what is in the cell at this moment in 10 femtosecond in a, in a three-dimensional or two-dimensional ray. You see, that is the dream in what we have with free electron lasers now. And therefore in Japan they built one, which is ready already. The Germans built one, the Swiss built one. It is the new way of, of doing structural research. The newest, say. Of course, with respect to spectroscopic events, you 
all Raman spectroscopy, all what you can think about is applied to, uh, to find out the function of membrane proteins. And uh, it would be, of course, interesting to see one day which method gives the most of the impact, most of the information. And then so far, I think it's really X-ray crystallography which gave most of the information. But in future, it may change. Ne? Enema can come up. And I do not know whether when really the dream of the free electron laser will be fulfilled in future, then of course that will give us an, a lot of information. Eh? Because you have a single protein then in the beam. And I think in future, for instance, there is one sort of uh, membrane proteins like G protein coupled receptors, G protein coupled receptors, which are very important for giving a signal to the nucleus in the cell. And these uh, G protein coupled receptors, we have 800 of them. 800. And, but we know from only now from 20 of them, the structure. We will never have solved these 800 structures, but we will, they, they are in groups. And we, will, we would like to have from each group a structure, then we can model the other structures. And this is the way we like to proceed. And we are working in this way together with Scripps in California. And Scripps has also a, a, a collaboration with Shanghai in China, because also the Chinese people see that there is a lot of impact on this thing in terms of medical treatments and drugs discovery and all these things.